guys my name is rosie the nanny or mama rosie the nanny i welcome you back to my youtube channel if you are new here please feel welcome to my faithful subscribers i say thank you thank you so much and asante nisana uh we are at uh, 31 subscribers or 100k subscribers please so today we are in a special show which is called uh, coffee table with rosie the nanny here we talk about real time real life shows uh, lifestyles and stories me as rosie i believe in stories that people tell because through your story it can inspire somebody else so with me i have a, a special guest uh, dad father figure he plays father figure in my life by the way and uh, i welcome him to the first show of coffee table with Rosie the Nani. Welcome. My name is Kasioka Kiyoko and I'm honored to be your father figure and to participate in your first uh, coffee table interview. I'm very honored. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So Kasioki Kiyoko will be talking about his life. We will start by, can you tell us about your, your life, childhood lifestyle? Okay, that is where we got to start, um, I was born in Machakos. Machakos is in Kenya. It's a small village. Um, and I grew up um, the village life. Uh, I went to the local schools. I went to Kithayoni Kindergarten. And then I proceeded to Mumboni Primary School. After, upon graduation, on eighth, was it eighth grade? Seventh grade, I moved on to Mumboni High School where I did my high school. And then um, after graduation, I moved to Nairobi, where I got a job at the Attorney General's office, where I worked for two years. And then um, all along, I was not very satisfied with uh, life at Sharia House. I was looking at my career path, and it was not very promising. So I decided to proceed on to the US. and. Um, I went to the US after the two years. I went to Keene University in New Jersey, um, where I've stayed most of my life. And even up to now, I'm still in the United States. Oh, that is very nice. Uh, speaking about Kasioko and uh, Kasioko Kiyoki, we are talking to him because he has gone through the country and outside country. We want to know what inspired you and how has life been? I was inspired by, I wanted to get knowledge. I'm always searching for knowledge. And here in Kenya, after my fourth form, uh, I did not join the University of Nairobi because at that time there was only one university in Kenya. And like today when we have so many universities, universities around. So I knew by not joining the University of Nairobi, my life was going to be not exactly what I wanted. So I decided to figure out a way of going out of the country. And uh, a friend of mine um, sent me an application um, to apply for, for, for university down there. Luckily, I was accepted at Keene University. And um, when I was doing that, I had not informed my parents about it. Mm -hmm. So I was doing it on my own. Oh. And um, after that admission, I went home with my admission letter. told my parents, okay, here I am. I'm going to the U.S. They asked me, are you kidding? How are you going to go? You have no money. And again, where is the U.S.? You are okay right here in, the United, in, in Kenya. And uh, uh, that's a good dream, uh, but you are not going. Number one, we don't have the money to send you. Number two, um, it's too far. We would not know how to parent you when you are so far. And uh, we think you are okay down here in Kenya. Um, I pushed them. I kept on pushing them. They kept on refusing. And then eventually, I remember I had to involve uh, my uncles. One time, uh, we ambushed my mother and my father with my uncles. And of course, I, I, uh, I started you know, crying and pushing. And um, until my parents... Um, accepted and said okay what we are going to do then is uh, you can go but then we have we have to call the community 
to fundraise because really we cannot um, afford to send you to the U.S. because I'm the firstborn in my family and there were others behind me and my father was like, okay, am I going to take care of you in the U.S. and take care of these other, uh, your siblings here? So we fundraised. We called um, villagers together. Um, we set on a Rambi in Kenya. That was a common thing and I think it still is today where the village comes uh, together and puts money together for a common good. And that common good at that time was me. And I'm very honored uh, that my, my, uh, my village and my neighbors and um, friends were able to sit down and say, okay, we think we should give this guy a shot to go to the U.S. And they raised the money and I was able to go to the United States. Oh, wow, that is very nice. So you've reached in the U.S. How was your career? Did your, how did your career start? Your first job? How did you cope? Um, when I get to the, got to the U.S., I arrived with very little money. I think it was, I think it was three hundred dollars. After paying tuition, I had three hundred dollars left for me to take care of me for the rest of my life because I had promised my father that I would never ask for money to be sent to me. So I had to look for a job in the U.S. Just to to ask. How much was three hundred dollars at that time? I think the exchange rate at shilling. that time was seven shillings to the dollar. Oh, God. <laughs> that's the money I arrived with. Yeah, I remember it was seven shillings to the dollar, and uh, that's what I started with, and uh, that included everything I was going to do for the next four years. Mm. So I was left no option but to look for a job. And luckily for me. Um, the university I went to had uh, student jobs where students uh, who have no money like myself are uh, encouraged to work to get a little pocket money. Mm -hmm. So I was employed as a janitor. A janitor is a guy who cleans your toilets. So I was cleaning uh, toilets in, um, at the university and I did that um, for a while. And then... Um, that money was still not enough. Mm. And I forgot to tell you what had happened at the Arambi mm. that was, um, that fundraised for me to go to the US. One of my uncles, his name is George W. Deng. He was an MP for Embakasi at one time. Um, he said, I'm not going to give you money. Right? Mm -hmm. And I was very mad with him. I was not very happy because I wanted money. He yeah. said, everybody will contribute money, but I am going to give you wood carvings. Wood carvings. Yes. Giraffes, lots of little cucumber things that we make. Right? And he told me, you can try. One day you might be broke and you might find a way of how to sell those things. Right? Mm -hmm. I didn't like that, but well, my uncle has given me this and um, he has um, he has blessed me with starting a, a business in the U.S. if I get the opportunity. Did you know that these wood carvings will make like a business in the U.S.? Do you have any idea? Or you just carried them to tell you the truth, I was just taking them with me because I don't want to let my, my uncle down. I never sold anything in my life. And I never saw myself selling anything in my life mm -hmm. because I actually wanted to be a lawyer. And lawyering has nothing to do with selling things. Mm -hmm. So I just took them for respect for my, my uncle. But when mm -hmm. I got to the U.S., things changed, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And my way of thinking also changed. Mm -hmm. And what changed is that um, um, like the second or third weekend after I arrived in New York, mm -hmm. um, me and a few other students, I met some people down there, and we went to a tour of New York City. Mm -hmm. I remember the first place we went, we took a train from um, Elizabeth, New Jersey to Penn Station, New York. And then we walked all the way all over the place. And then we went to this place near uh, New York University, 6th Avenue and West 4th Street in New York. And I found some Africans selling stuff in the street. Uh, speaking about that, uh, you talked about you being a janitor. How did it go? Did it, did at some point you felt like you don't want to do this kind of job, like you feel so bad about it, or you just did it gladly, with wholeheartedly? How did it go? What was the experience? My attitude in life is, when you start doing something, put your heart in it. Mm -hmm. I had no problem doing janitorial work. Others were doing it. It was paying me money, and it's a job that must be done. So I was actually very happy doing it, and... Um, 
I did it for quite a number of years. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that was so now, um, back to New York. Mm -hmm. So we started walking around New York and I saw Africans mm -hmm. selling things in the street. What you call orcas here in Kenya, mm -hmm. which uh, that's the English word for it, mm -hmm. is putting a blanket on the floor and putting items and selling to passers-by on this in the street. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wait a minute. This seems to be an opportunity. How about my, my carvings? Maybe I can start selling those carvings I was given to, by my uncle. Wow. But I did not have uh, the guts to do it. But that is an idea that I had now. Mm -hmm. And started thinking about it. Mm -hmm. uh, we came to New York several other times. And I got, started getting very interested. One time I remember I went and sat behind these uh, uh, vendors who were selling things. And I I noticed how much money they were making. Mm -hmm. And then I got the courage mm -hmm. and said, next week, I am coming here and I'm selling these things. And that's how I got into business. Oh, wow. So you started s selling the carvings. I started selling the carvings. I had a little corner on 6th Avenue and West 4th Street. That became my corner. The first day I set up, it was around th like 3 in the afternoon. It was on a Saturday, I remember. I set up my merchandise and before I could even taking them out of the basket I was carrying, I had like 20 or 30 dollars in my pocket. And wow. people were like, wow, what is this? They're so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Americans are very, um, very interested in art and things made by hand. And they've never seen um, my kind of merchandise in New York. Mm -hmm. I think I can claim that I was the first person to sell wood carvings in the streets of New York. Wow. And that is that time. So, end of the day, I had something like $200 because I was selling these things for $10, $15, like that. I had almost more money than I left Kenya with in a very short period of time. And so, that motivated me a lot. So, so the, the, the present that you were given by your uncle yes. made you become a businessman in the U.S.? Yes. Yeah. Be because now what happened is, after I saw these, these, these items, I said, okay, I've run out of merchandise, but I know there's an opportunity and I don't know where else to get these things. I have to find a way of contacting my father to go back to my uncle to get some more. Back then, there were no telephone, you know, uh, cell phones or computers or whatever. We used to write letters. So I wrote to my father. To, it used to take seven days to write one way. He receives it of seven days and he thinks about it for two days and he replies to me. So it's a process of about Two weeks or so. Okay. And the re response I got from my father was, heck no, <laughs> you are not doing that. You went to school. Mm -hmm. You did not go to the U.S. to become an orca. Mm -hmm. Because I think an orca is something a lot of people would not want to be identified with. I had no problem, but my father had a problem. Yeah. So now you are hawking. You are sending merchandise on the street. Yeah. I believe there are challenges that you are facing. What were the challenges? Okay, the challenges I faced most of the time was selling in the street the sun. That time, when I, was, when I arrived in New York and that, when I started selling, it was the summertime. Number one, it was very hot, mm -hmm. right? And I'm there and I'm boiling in the street, right? And um, that was one of the challenges. But the start part of it was not very complicated because the vendors who were selling in the streets or the hawkers who were selling in the street were not that many. But over, ye over, over the years now, because I continued doing it and doing it, and a lot of other people started seeing that opportunity. A lot of people started pouring in the streets. Wow. And pretty soon we congested the streets. We had um, the orcas from South America, Africa, Americans, all so over. So, so we became a street menace. <laughs> so competition began. Yeah. yeah. And not competition. I did not have any competition. Nobody was selling what I was selling. Wow. It was only me selling the African things, right? Mm -hmm. But now, the streets are congested with people selling things. And I made, some of my best friends, I made them in the street. We became like a, a fraternity. We became uh, your brother's keeper over time. And uh, some of the friends I value, actually we started the friendship down there. Most of those people um, were students and others were not. Others were just uh, people coming from uh, different parts of the world and selling things and buying things. 
from New York City and sending back to their country. Mm. And I started also seeing that as an, a future, um, a future uh, business I can do, where I can also export to Kenya. Oh, and you, while you were selling, police were not disturbing you, like they come, maybe harass you guys, and you run with your merchandise behind <laughs> your back, and yeah. they were not, nothing like that? Well, we started a few, very few people. Mm -hmm. Over time, we became very many. Mm -hmm. There was nowhere to pass in New York City. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so now, the city had to do something about it. I knew it. And uh, now the city started saying, okay, you guys, you have become a little bit too much. You are a menace to the city, and we have to clean these streets. You can do, you, you have to stop doing this thing. And uh, the money was so sweet, we couldn't. Some of us, we couldn't. And I'm still working in the, at the, at the university cleaning the toilets. Mm -hmm. So actually, um, my friends coined a name. They started calling me Kasioka Mapesa. Ah. I had so much money. It's unbelievable. Anyway, so the police started um, chasing us. It started by chasing us. Mm -hmm. Then we'll watch. we we'll see them. Okay, they are gone. We come back again. Right? And we kept on doing this over time. Then over time, they decided, okay, we are going to be confiscating your things. They started on tightening it, tightening it. So they started con confiscating our merchandise. They'll come, they'll take your, your merchandise, they take it away, auction it, and mm -hmm. do something for the city, homeless people, whatever it was. I don't know what it was. And then uh, it escalated. They started um, arresting us and taking our merchandise. And when you are arrested, it's a misdemeanor. It's just like a violation, a city violation. It's not a criminal thing. Mm -hmm. It's what they call misdemeanors. A very low misdemeanor, which is just a violation. It's just like urinating in the street or something like that. It's classified in that category. Mm -hmm. So you'll be arrested. You'll be taken downtown. you go through the process. Within 24 hours, you've gone through a real cell with real criminals in it. Then you are processed. You have to go to the judge. You read your name. And then you said, okay, you are caught selling stuff in the street and you're not supposed to do that. Yes, it's your sentence is community service. Community service is cleaning parks, uh, cleaning the street, sweeping things, and uh, any, any, any property that is owned by the city, you go and do whatever the, you'll be taught to do. And one of the craziest things was me wearing a jacket. You see the reflectors? The motorbikers, the border, border guys wear, uh, the, those reflectors, they had them in New York, which it said convict in the front and then the back. It says convict. Really? Yeah. So I'm on Times Square. Some of you have been to Times Square. You know how crowded it is. And every now and then a Kenyan who knows me would see me when I'm doing this work. And they'll start laughing at me. And they start saying, because yoga is lost in the U.S. And I didn't give up. I didn't care, right? Because I knew what I was doing. And um, like I said before, usually when I start doing something, I put my heart into it, and I don't care about these other distractions around here. I'll continue doing what I was doing. So I continued doing it. Oh. Yeah. How did you cope with the, with the failure and setback? Like when the, the police set you to go to go and uh, wear that thing and you, you sweep and you wash, how did you cope with it? It actually motivated more ah. because I said, okay, I am going to make it even better where I will not be dealing with this problem. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I decided because I know there's a business um, opportunity here and a potential to create a real serious business. I will continue with the hardships and you have put some money in together and get a store of my own. Oh, wow. And I continued doing that and eventually I became an importer of um, African crafts from Kenyan chondos and carvings and all kinds of things from Kenya. Wow. I'll put them in a container. A container is those big trucks you see. Mm -hmm. and ship it to a warehouse. I had now um, made made it to where I had a warehouse and I was doing also business of the same things. So I was able actually to start from the little, um, the few items my uncle had given me in Kenya mm. and focus on it and growing it. And I grew it and I grew it until it became a very successful business. So your uncle was your biggest supporter here in Kenya, sending you merchandise, then you sell it in the US. 
Yes, uh, my uncle and my, my father now, I, I remember I said earlier that I wrote my father mm -hmm. um, to buy me more stuff. Eventually he agreed, he okay. said, okay, you can do it mm -hmm. as long as you are going to school, which I was going to school. Mm -hmm. And I was only selling these things on a Friday mm -hmm. evening, mm -hmm. Saturday and Sunday. New York is a 24 hour economy. There are people in the streets all night. Mm -hmm. So I was also selling through the night of those mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. and, I was, and my father eventually accepted that I can do that mm -hmm. and go to school and I did that. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. So what did, do you consider the biggest achievement up to date? Well, I can say I, my business grew. It became very uh, successful. Up to now? I'm still in business. I'm still not employed. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah. So um, after after college, I continued the, with that business, and now I started also exporting things from Kenya, uh, from the U.S. into Kenya. So I started um, selling uh, wigs, wigs, weaves, mm -hmm. beauty products, mm -hmm. and what I would do is. I'll sell my carvings, which came from Kenya, mm -hmm. make money in, in, in the U.S. Uh -huh. And to buy more carvings, what mm -hmm. I'll do is I'll mm -hmm. send that money mm -hmm. in merchandise form. I had partnership in Nairobi where these items will be sold. And now I'll get that money, cycle, recycle it into carvings, send it in the U.S. As a matter of fact, I had an office, um, you know the Nairobi Hilton? There's that path which goes under the Hilton. Mm -hmm. I had a, a little um, a little space on the second floor where mm -hmm. I was selling weaves, uh, air products, all kinds of women stuff, and it was it was it did quite well. How did you realize you've, you? How did it feel that you know that you have achieved success? Now you are in the U.S. You mm -hmm. are not suffering now. You have achieved everything that you wanted. You can come, import, export, and do all those things. I think I realized that I had, I, I had made it mm -hmm. the first day I printed a catalog. I had a catalog of all the items I was selling. And then uh, I went to, a, to a, what they call a, a merchandise show. Mm -hmm. A merchandise show is where different vendors from different parts of the world, they showcase mm -hmm. the items they sell, mm -hmm. and then they give um, people catalogs with a telephone number where those people, back then there was no internet, there was nothing. It mm -hmm. was print. So we printed that catalog and I was able to go to, to uh, one of those shows. It was a Jack of Javis Center, mm -hmm. which is a big deal. And I was able to sell. I remember how excited I was when the, I got the first order. And that's the moment I realized, by the way, I think I've made it because now I was all kinds of big businesses. You find big business showcasing their merchandise and among all these big businesses, I am one of them. I am one of those guys who were in the streets not too long ago. And now I'm in mainstream business. And, I, and that was a, a serious success to me. Wow, yeah. that is so good. So you, I forgot to ask you this. The, the moment that you reach at the US, yeah. is there something they call it racism? The, the, that uh, now you're a black colored person and they are white. Did you face any challenge with them? How was life? Well, life was tough. Uh -huh. I remember the first three days I did not eat when I arrived in the US. Oh. Why? Um, nobody could understand what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> Living in Nairobi, I, I thought I knew how to speak in English and how to express myself and do whatever I want to do. Yo. <laughs> so here I am in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and I was staying, the, the first place I stayed was at the YMC. I stayed there for at least a week or so mm -hmm. because the person who was supposed to receive me in the U.S., mm -hmm. I found, I did not find them. Mm -hmm. They were elsewhere and they came a week later. So mm -hmm. this first week I was staying at the, at the YMCA. YMCA is an hostel. Mm -hmm. So this hostel, there was a, a McDonald's not too far from there, right? And I remember going there to order food, and I could not say it right. And I got a little bit embarrassed, so I said, ah, forget it. I'll go upstairs and sleep. Mm -hmm. I went upstairs, drank water from the bathroom tap, and slept. The next day, the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then I was getting, I don't know. 
I don't know why I was so scared. I don't know. I think it was that sudden change of you're coming from Kenya, where you knew everybody, where you knew where everything was, where you knew how to move around. And now here you are, and you don't know anybody you are by yourself. So uh, it took me three days to get the courage. Oh, wow. And to get the courage to order, to, to, to write, for, to, to order it the way they can understand me. I was helped by, by the manager of that McDonald's because he had noticed me coming there, standing online, and walking back with nothing. Mm -hmm. So he, he took the interest in trying to find out what is going on. Mm -hmm. And I tried to order, and I, you know, we had a conversation. He understood that he just come from Africa and all that. So he helped me make the first order of food. Racism. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was there. Racism is still in the, in the United States up to today. Mm -hmm. We have learned uh, how to live around it. Uh, but there's a lot of very um, good people in America who do not, who, who welcome uh, strangers, uh, Africans, black people, but there are others who don't. So, yeah, it was there. Wow. So, are there specific strategies mm -hmm. or habits that helped you on how to achieve your, your dream? I think it was just focus. Mm -hmm. And I, I saw an opportunity and I had to run with it. It had a lot of challenges, but every day I woke up and I pushed harder. Every day I woke up and I pushed harder. Wow. I'm still pushing hard mm -hmm. today mm -hmm. because it never ends, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, one of the things that did not happen to me, I was not discouraged by the setbacks. A lot of people, when we started getting arrested in New York as vendors in the street, got mm -hmm. discouraged and started doing other things. They left me there mm -hmm. in the street. And at one point, um, before I even started importing containers of merchandise, I found that somehow a way of working with homeless people in New York. Mm -hmm. a lot of, at that time, there were a lot of people um, who were homeless in New York. And every now and then, somebody would be asking you for a dollar or begging for something or whatever. So I said, okay, instead of it giving you this dollar, why, why, why can't I find a way of these people earning that dollar from me? Because I want to give it, mm -hmm. but again, I don't have enough to give to anybody. Mm -hmm. So I started giving them jobs of uh, selling in the street the same way I started, okay? Mm -hmm. Because it's unlikely homeless people will be arrested. Wow. Right? Mm -hmm. So I'll set up somebody with a little... Uh, set up over here a few items and another one over there and another one over there and another one over there and then they sell I give them a commission they sell I give them a commission wow. if the police come they don't bother them yes, yes right yeah. and uh, they don't mind being bothered and I was not I did not feel like I was abusing them no I wasn't because I'd gone through that path myself and they appreciated they appreciated um, the money they were making and I appreciate the money they were making for me and I was so loved, I can say even that, uh, by these homeless people in New York. We became buddies, even up to today. You're still buddies. Yeah, there's one time I went to New York with my family, mm -hmm. and somebody called me from the street, from nowhere. Mm -hmm. And my kids asked me, Dad, how do you know that person? He knows me, because mm -hmm. he was my buddy. We worked together, mm -hmm. and we were still friends. And, uh, and I really... Um, uh, feel that um, the homeless people, we work together with them and we became very good friends and never ever look down on somebody. You don't know their story because the stories I heard from these people, the stories of how they became homeless, I realize anybody can anytime. Okay, guys, after the break, we will get to know more about Kasioki and get to know how and how he has succeeded until up to now. <laughs> 